It's the Maxwell Institute Podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. Thanks for listening to another episode. Uh, You might remember the last episode with Dr. Mark Brettler. He's a Jewish scholar of the Bible, and he was here talking about the book The Bible and the Believer. In that book, a Jewish scholar, a Protestant scholar, and a Catholic scholar got together and asked, does academic study of the Bible undermine the value of the Bible or diminish its religious message? Is it difficult for people to approach the Bible both critically and religiously? And in this episode, we're joined by Dr. Peter Enns. Dr. Enns is the Protestant contributor to that book, and he actually just put out a new book himself. That book is called The Bible Tells Me So, Why Defending Scripture Has Made Us Unable to Read It. Dr. Enns feels that although critical scholarship can change a person's relationship to the Bible, it doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. In fact, it can help strengthen faith. It's Dr. Peter Enns in this episode of the Maxwell Institute Podcast. We're talking about Protestantism and biblical criticism, biblical scholarship in this episode with Dr. Peter Enns. He's professor of biblical studies at Eastern University in Pennsylvania. Welcome to the Maxwell Institute podcast, Dr. Enns. Thanks for coming to the show. Oh, thank you, Blair, for having me. It's great to be here. Is it Dr. Enns? Is that what I'm supposed to go with on this one? Or um, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you know, you can call me Pete. Most, um, Just my wife and kids call me Dr. <laughs> Everybody else does, so just go by first name. So That's we're good. good. We're That's good, good, good. good. Yeah. All right. So uh, so you're an evangelical Christian, right? You're you're a Protestant and you're also a biblical scholar and you've you've put a lot of books out that talk about the Bible um, from an academic perspective, from the perspective of a believer. There's one particular book, uh, The Bible and the Believer that you co-authored with uh, a Catholic scholar and a, a Jewish scholar and I've I've actually spoken with Mark Brettler, the Jewish oh, great, scholar, yeah. and so he, uh, yeah, so he precedes you, and and you're writing from the perspective of a scholar and a believer. Your new book is called "The Bible Tells Me So: Why Defending Scripture Has Made Us Unable to Read It." This is a, a new book from Harper uh, that that just came out. So we're going to kind of talk about these books and your experiences. One of the things that stuck out to me as I was reading "The Bible and the Believer" is you say that many evangelicals. Or, or Protestant Christians who become exposed to biblical criticism begin what you call a long and unsettling spiritual journey. That was interesting to me because it's it's scholarship that's that's being thought about here by by people, and it it sets off this unsettling spiritual journey. Is that kind of how it worked for you? I'm interested in in your story, how you got into this uh, situation as a scholar and believer. Yeah, well, I mean, I appreciate you saying many, uh, because it's not all. You know, there are, there are right. you know, people within this very broad spectrum of believers called evangelicals that, you know, negotiate, navigate these things differently. Um, and for me, you know, it wasn't as unsettling as it might have been for for others, largely because I wasn't raised in an evangelical home. I, I became a Christian when I was a teenager, although I was raised sort of Lutheran by my parents, but they had this sort of, you know, European approach to faith, which is, it's fine, just don't let it get out of hand. You know, it's not (laughs) something you sort of act on all the time. So, um, you know, so for me, uh, I I didn't have some of the same, uh, you know, baggage, uh, to put it that way, as, as some people might have when they encounter you know, the modern study of Scripture that's been going on for a few hundred years now. So, um, you know, it wasn't as unsettling for me. So why did you get interested to begin with in in doing academic work in Scripture? Well, yeah, um, I think, you know, I can boil it down to one incident in my life that sort of pushed me in this direction, although I didn't really know I was going to head in this direction. And it was after I graduated college, I met with a couple of friends of mine, and uh, one of whom went to a Christian college, and the other one uh, went to a state university who was an uh, atheist and a philosophy major. And my friend went to a Christian college, and unlike me, he learned a lot. And I, I didn't learn too much when I went to college. I played baseball, and that's pretty much all I cared about. And hmm. I was watching these guys talk about God and deep thoughts, and I thought to myself, my goodness gracious, it just it hit me like like a lightning bolt. I didn't learn anything about this faith that I say I have. 
And that sort of really pushed me into reading and reading anything I could get my hands on that had anything to do with the Bible or, you know, Israelite history or New Testament or theology or anything. And, you know, three years later, I find myself in seminary, um, not really to train to be a pastor, but just because I wanted to know things. I I was on an intellectual journey, a quest, and that wound up um, after four years of seminary, I I was, you know, sort of morphing between, at one point, church history, then New Testament, but then I I settled on Old Testament about halfway through my time in seminary, and Park, as one of my teachers, uh, did the math for me. He said, um, the Old Testament's about four times the size of the New, and there are about four times as many jobs out there, and I said, that's a really good point. So So you were thinking at that point of, like, going into the academy further on then? I was, yeah, yeah, in seminary, and uh, for you, like, what you know, other just, options would have been available? Because for Mormons, they, Mormons don't yeah. go to school to become trained for their ministry, right? So, like, what kind of options are open to a uh, uh, Christian as you were going to school? Well, you know, it, it depends. It's, if you go to a denominational seminary, um, you know, usually what they do is they train people there for some type of pastoral mis- ministry or missionary work or also to go on for further study. Mm-hmm. Um, my seminary wasn't actually denominational. It was part of a theological tradition, but it wasn't denominational, like Presbyterian or Lutheran or something like that. So, um, But even there, you know, people are trained, and, and most people who go to seminary wind up doing some type of church vocational work, mm-hmm. whether it's in a mission field or whether it's in a church as a pastor, as a youth pastor, as an education person, you know, um, uh, and or if sometimes, for example, teaching in Christian high schools, hmm. you know, but, things but, like that. So there, there are a lot of options. But you were sort of thinking you were you wanted to go on and do university stuff, right? And, and that's oh, I wanted kind to of, know everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, <laughs> I, okay, I wanted and, to know things, so I, I knew I was going to go to university. And on a pragmatic level, then your advisor was saying, "Look, uh, Old Testament—that's where it's at because there's just a lot. There's a lot more there, a lot more to work with, more jobs, etc." Right. Yeah, and there's a little less cynical answer, too, that's at least as important as that, which is, um, you know, as Christians, uh, one of the challenges has always been, what do you do with the Old Testament? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I wanted to sort of wrap my arm around bigger questions of how do we handle a book that seems particularly foreign and distant for most Christians, including myself. And so, I, and, and a lot of that was spurred on by good professors and good teaching in seminary. Some people, when they first hear about some issues with the Bible, like, you know, a scholar will say, well, there, there probably wasn't this huge exodus, right? That, that right. There might not have been an Abraham. These are things that some biblical scholars will say, and, and that will unsettle some Christians who will say, whoa, that's, that's kind of seems to threaten my the foundations of my faith here. So did you feel that existential threat at any point? Or for you, was it more like, wow, these are some really interesting things to study? Like what, what direction did it hit you from? Uh, I think both, but not in seminary. It was more going to graduate school Mm. where, um, you know, I, I, and and the Bible tells me, so I talk about this at some length, uh, not too much length, I hope, but where, (laughs) you know, I felt as if, um, information that everyone, many people take for granted outside of an evangelical world, I was sort of almost shielded or protected from in seminary, or it was sort of spun in ways that would make too many waves. And in that sense, you know, going to, um, you know, to graduate school and, and listening to people and listening to arguments and reading books, things started making a lot of sense. And there was both an excitement dimension to it, like, because you're discovering something, mm. But also at times, you know, an unsettling dimension. Many a time I would just sort of sit there and say, you know, this has implications for what I think I believe, and, and I need to start working these things out. What did you feel? I mean, so you'd, you've been going to seminary. Did you feel – what did you feel toward your teachers and people who had sort of you, – maybe you felt just simply avoided these things or sort of ignored them? Did, was there any sense of feeling like, hey, my education should have been better than that, or what kind of sense did you have for what your education had been up to that point when you realized there was more to the story? Um, I think I came to that realization that you're describing maybe a little bit later, but, you know, while I was in graduate school, I didn't really think in a sour way backwards to to my seminary teaching, uh, seminary curriculum, because, you know, in part one thing I was taught was don't be afraid to put things on a shelf. You don't have to settle answers as soon mm-hmm. as you hear something. 
Just think about it. It's fine. So I sort of even went in with a mentality where I might not have been informed in terms of content or data, let's say. Mm -hmm. But I had a disposition that was formed that allowed me to sort of say, listen, I'm not really sure how these pieces fit together. There are many more pieces than I thought there were, and there are weird shapes. I just don't know how they fit. But it's okay. You know, it, it's not about having the final answers to those things. And that's very much a temperament that, um, you know, I've taken with me and I've held with me now for, you know, 25 years or so. I wonder if the position of the Bible in Protestantism has something to do with your ability to be a, a bit more flexible there. And so let's let's sort of zoom out a little bit and talk about okay. pr Protestant for a Mormon audience. And what the word Protestant indicates, as you say, it covers sort of a wide range of perspectives, right? Right. Absolutely. Um yeah, I, I don't know if that we we can talk about what boy what Protestantism Protestantism is is a good way to get into trouble, you know, because everybody, <laughs> you know, there are different Protestants and they think differently. But I'm not sure if that is actually helped make me more flexible. I think that might have, for me at least, created some barriers that I've had to navigate around because of how, let's say, conservative Protestantism let's just say evangelicalism, uh, sort of approaches the Bible and what the Bible is expected to do. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not sure if Protestantism is really the, 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 the gateway that opened these great doors for me to walk through. I sort of had to knock on them for a while and force my way in. Well, one of the things I'm thinking specifically is, for example, within, let, let's take Catholicism, for example. You have scripture, and you also have tradition, and you have church uh, leadership that's that sort of serves as a an arbiter uh, that looks at scripture and helps drive interpretation of it, right? So I think that it seems to me. I know there are Catholics that have many different takes on the Bible. There's a spectrum in Catholicism as well as right. as Protestantism, but but it seems generally there's a bit more institutional pressure within Catholicism to where you know you have to sort of align yourself with these official views of particular scriptural injunctions or scriptural interpretations, whereas with Protestantism, it seems more possible to to shift to a different area of Protestantism. You mentioned conservative. There's fundamentalists who read very mm -hmm. literalistically, right? And you don't have mm -hmm. to attend that. As a Protestant, you can choose another right. denomination, right? So you're sort of already aware that there are different takes on the Bible, and then you get to sort of do your own exploration and then kind of go from there. Does that Does that make sense? You know, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, see, the irony, though, is that you will find within the Roman Catholic world, you know, a tremendous engagement with historical critical biblical scholarship, which mm -hmm. is just a way of saying modern biblical scholarship. Mm -hmm. um, there's a stamp of approval, a papal stamp of approval from uh, Pope Benedict, at least, I read it from him, where, you know, there's an embrace of the methodologies of historical criticism, but not necessarily the philosophy behind it. Right. And, you know, you want to be careful in how you negotiate church doctrine, um, which is a temperament I very much agree with. And you can do that very much in certain quarters of Protestantism, more mainline or li so-called liberal Protestantism, that they don't really have a problem with that. But from within a conservative world, you have the doctrine that trumps all doctrines, which is the doctrine of biblical inerrancy. Mm -hmm. And even though that's defined in many different ways, um, and nuances, and you know, intelligent people hold to it, and all that sort of stuff, still, it creates a ceiling that, in my experience, is very low, where if you're a biblical scholar, it's sort of hard to stand up in the room upright and, and, and make cases and make arguments, because there's only so far you can go. Let's talk about inerrancy. Flesh that out, define that, kind of give, give uh, my listeners an idea about how that looks from within a Protestant perspective, because we've heard a lot of caricatures of what that means, and I think there's more of a spectrum of what that, you know, how that's used, I guess. Yeah, absolutely, and, and the spectrum is... Um, it means a lot to people because the, the term has a lot of meaning, a lot of social capital, let's say, in different Protestant circles. So it really is difficult to define inerrancy in a way that's going to make everybody happy. Because mm -hmm. you have people in different ends of the spectrum of inerrancy that really think the other end of the spectrum is crazy and they right. don't want to listen to them. So, But basically, um, you expect the Bible to give you more or less basically accurate historical information, accurate moral guidance, 
and the Bible reveals God as he is to us. And you don't disagree with the biblical teaching. You don't argue with the Bible. You don't debate with the Bible. You take it as it is um, presented to you, the information as it's presented to you. And even as I say that, I know there's some people who are narratives who would disagree with that definition. I want to hold to it. I think it works pretty well. Mm -hmm. Um, The more generous the narratives would say something like, the Bible is without error in everything that it teaches or affirms which is a helpful starting point, but the question then turns very quickly to, okay, what is the Bible teaching or affirming? Right. And that's not an easy thing to ferret out, you know. So, um, yeah, I think once you start defining those terms, you get into some, uh, you know, debates that are just waiting to happen. But um, the Bible is central, and everything is based on biblical teaching, and uh, it's it's, it's a, a... completely reliable, infallible rule to faith and to life. And that's more or less maybe one way of expressing inerrancy. And I think that speaks to the centrality of the Bible from from an authority standpoint within Protestantism, right? So I mentioned right. a little bit about Catholics where, as you mentioned, like the Pope gave his blessing to you know, mo- mo- certain methods of modern biblical scholarship. But for Catholics, that blessing was important because of the way their church is set up. I think for <clears throat> For uh, Latter-day Saints, it would be similar with their prophets, uh, seers and revelators, their quorum of the Twelve, and these authorities that uh, that sort of guide scriptural interpretation or, or um, you know, within the church. Right. So Mormons have scripture and church authorities. Uh, Catholics have scripture and church authorities. For Protestants, it seems like scripture is sort of – and wasn't that Luther's whole point, right? Sola Scriptura was like this, this is it. Well, correct. Although, uh, you know, one caricature of sola scriptura, scripture alone, is that it's literally scripture alone and nothing else. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, the Reformers did have, you know, tremendous respect for the good part of church tradition. (laughs) You know, not Mm -hmm. not all of it, but but they realized that, you know, this is a tradition that goes back to the Apostles, and they're not just making something up here with the Bible. And it didn't seem to counter the Bible either, right? That's sort of how they would sort of judge those things, right? Like this particular tradition isn't contradicted in the Bible. Yeah, right, exactly. They, they would use the Bible as the basis for adjudicating whether traditions are true or not. Yeah. Right. So, you know, and that's, um, you know, a, a good idea in, in theory, you know, if I can put it that way, and, mm-hmm. and it is. You know, we want to listen to the Bible, and I actually agree with that. We, we, we don't want to make a move without engaging the Bible very, very seriously, but you know, it is in the wake of the Protestant Reformation that you start having multiple denominations mm-hmm. and translations of the Bible. I mean, one thing that Luther did was translate the Bible into German, which sort of unified the German language, but it also um, let more people read it. And once people read it, they start disagreeing about what it means. Yeah. And, you know, so Sola Scriptura is, is, is you know, listen, we want to pay attention to it, but there always has to come within Protestantism, there's always an authoritative office of some sort that comes into play, except for Protestants, it's not one central office. It's each denomination has its own way of doing things, mm-hmm. and you're answerable to that particular denomination. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's they don't all operate the same way, but you, you have some type of, you know, with a lowercase p, papal authority in in Protestant churches. And, and in a popular sense, there are, there are Protestants and evangelicals and fundamentalists who sort of insert themselves into national dialogues in ways that almost functionally for some people makes them national figures. And if this person is saying this, we need to be following along with them. So I mean, these things happen in a de, in a de facto way. Like who? But like for authority. example, are there like are you talking about people like Pat Robertson, or are there more? Because he seems less. He seems just more sort of charismatic and kind of got his own thing. Are there other figures that sort of serve as bellwethers for um, Protestants? Uh, well, for some, I mean, not for all Protestants, but somebody mm-hmm. like you know Al Mohler at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, mm-hmm. he'd be a good example of someone who has a microphone and a very large audience. Um, 
which isn't to say that Protestants follow in his footsteps. They mm-hmm. don't. Not even Baptists don't even follow in his footsteps. But there is still a national platform that um, you know has a certain authority to it, where at least people will be cautious to contradict. Hmm. Okay. That... But again, Protestantism is a broad thing. We can't, I'm being very right. careful here not to suggest that you know. There, there is no one person who speaks in the same way for all Protestants as there would be someone speaking for all Catholics. Right. So, it, for, and, and again, for that reason, sort of the Bible really uh, serves to as as the the ground which everyone sort of goes to to arbitrate differences, right? Like, so the Bible right. is so central that way, um, and that's sort of what sparked Protestantism, as you mentioned, is is sort of democratizing access to the Bible, which uh, led to different interpretations, which led to different denominations and this sort of thing. What's interesting in um, in the Bible and Believer, you write that you encourage Protestants to turn that Protestant spirit inward. Uh, mm-hmm. Do you remember? So can you expand on, on what you meant by that? Yeah, it's it's a matter of being self-critical, not only not simply critical towards others that mm-hmm. you disagree with, but critical towards yourself, to always going back to Scripture, to re-examining even some things that you hold most dear. I think that's the true Protestant spirit, to sort of turn it inward, and not always to sort of in a defensive or, or an attacking way towards people on the outside, which does happen. Because, you know, when you do have different denominations, um, they all say, we believe in the Bible, we listen to it, we read it, we follow it, yet they disagree. Mm-hmm. So what they really mean is not the Bible, but the way we've come to understand the Bible in our tradition. That's our authority. Right. right. So th- that can be um, that can very quickly turn into simply um, uh, a process of, of defining yourself over against the other, and you know you're right. You're just defending yourself against another denomination or another uh, tradition on the outside, mm-hmm. which means you never have time. For, you're always in battle mode. You're always in combat mode. You don't have time to sort of reflect and say, you know, a lot of stuff's happened in the past 300 years. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we need to think, rethink some things and to do it with a sense of expectation that maybe God's a part of our rethinking, not just a part of our holding on to what we've always thought. And you think that biblical scholarship should be a component that Christians use to help do that self-evaluation? I I think it should definitely be a part of the conversation and not, as it sometimes is, ignored unless it provides the right answers. Okay, so there are instances where people are fine with using biblical scholarship when it reaffirms something that they'd already like to advance. Is that kind of what you're saying? That's correct. Yeah. And you're saying that that's kind of unfair. That it, it, if you're going to make use of scholarship, it needs to be, uh, it needs to be across the board. It shouldn't just be piecemeal and selective that way. Right. And I think yeah, piecemeal is a good word. Um, just you know, this is in my experience. I've seen, uh, you know, the, the pro- conservative Protestant academia. Let's put it that way, and mm-hmm. which involves biblical scholarship. Much of what they do. And again, this is the, the, we're getting somewhat reductionistic in some of these things. Yeah. But much of what they do is preserving pre-critical, in some cases pre-modern, ways of thinking, but having to use modern methods to do it. Mm-hmm. But to use those modern methods and come to some modern conclusions in as minimal a way as possible to still preserve those pre-modern, pre-critical theological tenets. And that creates a significant tension within biblical scholars in the Protestant world who say, you know, you're just trying to protect inerrancy here. Mm -hmm. And no one thinks this way about this issue than these people here in this room. So maybe we should be scholars and not sort of sit here, but move beyond that. And, um, and, And maybe it's time to rethink some of these things. And that can be hard to do, right? I mean, you in Bible and the Believer, you actually go through three specific obstacles that you say help disincentivize uh, some Protestants from making good use of biblical scholarship. The first one we kind of talked about a little bit already, sola scriptura, that's the first one that you bring up, and that's, you know, strictly translated the Bible alone. But you pointed out how it's more complicated than that, that no one can really just go by the Bible alone, because any reading of the Bible includes interpretation. It sort of 
built in with it. Is that is that fair to that's, say? That's correct. Yeah, yeah. Because people, a lot of people say, look, sola scriptura, just open up the Bible and just go with what the Bible says, and then call it good. And 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 you're saying the the problem with that is that <laughs> you already have so many different interpretations that you know just saying we say we go by what the Bible says already kind of poses a problem and. So scholarship. Right, no, one, no one approaches it, right? No yeah. one approaches it without a bias or without a yeah. precondition of some sort. So then scholarship can be recruited then sort of to either prop up pre-existing um, conclusions or challenge pre-existing conclusions. And that's where some of this tension comes from when you put critical readings of the Bible next to devotional readings of the Bible. It's this idea that who's in charge here, uh, scholars or God's word kind of a thing. Right, exactly. That that's sometimes the way it's pitted, which is very unfortunate. But yeah. that's that's quite common, actually. So that's that's kind of the first obstacle. That sola scriptura. The second uh, obstacle that you bring up in, just involves the overall nature of the Christian Bible, and and you contrast a Christian reading of the Bible with Jewish approaches. And you mentioned this briefly earlier, just that uh, uh, your interest as a Christian in the Old Testament was partly spurred by wondering how these two books are related and. And one of the things I really liked uh, the way you worded this, you said for Jewish approaches versus Christian approaches, you said for one group, it's the Bible is a word to be declared, whereas for Judaism, uh, Scripture is a problem with many facets. Can you unpack yeah. that a little bit? Well, yeah, the, the um, much of the history of Jewish engagement of its Scripture has been very willing to debate with each other, mm-hmm. and even debate with Scripture as part of what it means to be faithful to God. It's it's built into the system, so to speak, to have these kinds of debates or dialogues. And, you know, one of the uh, easiest places to see this is in the Talmud, which is, you know, this compilation of, of revered Jewish teaching, where you have rabbis arguing back and forth about what things mean, but then you move on to the next topic, you don't have to resolve it. Right. Um, much of Christian theology, and this is certainly true of Protestant evangelical theology, is that you can't do that with the Bible and still have it be authoritative. Mm. So you want the Bible not to be sort of a multifaceted, dimensional thing that you can sort of look at perspectives and things like that. It has to have a message that you proclaim. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, creates some tensions when... Uh, the Bible doesn't behave that way. When there are contradictions or tensions or differences in perspective, whatever we want to call them, um, that are actually inviting some type of debate and dialogue. And I I think there's a lot that Christians can actually learn from how Jews have handled their Scripture historically. Right. You talk about the resisting a univocal text, right? So Christians can approach the Bible as though it tells this one single story, as though everything can line up, but then a problem happens when you start noticing fissures in the text and contradictions and things like that. Right. What what type of things uh, might Christians bump into as, as they're reading the Bible that, that starts to alert them to these issues? Uh, well, a good example, um, and, and you know, people who have read the Bible a fair amount, this is not a new thing, this is not a surprise, but the fact that the Old Testament contains two histories of Israel mm-hmm. that are they're not the same. They're not reconcilable. They, they, they present the history of the monarchy, you know, David and so on, all that stuff. They present the history of the monarchy from a very different angle, a very different slant, and they say things that you just, you can't harmonize them. Yeah. And, you know, that, that is, you know, a window, I think, open. That's a good thing. That's, that's an aid that we have in the Bible for the kind of information we should expect from it, and that maybe reconciling all these things because there are problems that have to be solved um maybe they don't you know maybe we're expecting something from the bible that it's not really prepared to give us and and i think the bible itself the way the christian bible is set up i think if we pay attention it demonstrates that for us and 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 the big issue for for christians i think is how you have you know, the, 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 the gospel, which is the last part of the Christian Bible, the New Testament, 
which itself is in tension with various portions of the Old Testament. Not right. completely in tension, but very much at various points in tension. Things that are central to Israel's life and faith are not central to the life and faith of what you read in Paul's letters and, and other places in the New Testament. Um, things like temple, you know, is not central anymore. Land is not central anymore. Circumcision is not central anymore. Dietary restrictions are not central anymore. And some of these things fall away. And um, our own Bible has this dynamic quality to it. We're harmonizing and making sure each piece of the Bible is on exactly the same page. Right. That becomes very stressful. Yeah. A little further on, we'll, we'll go into a few examples, because in The Bible Tells Me So, much of the book is dedicated to confronting a few particular difficulties in the in the Bible uh, that, that people pull out. So um, we'll, we'll get to that momentarily. I'm speaking today with Dr. Peter Enns. He's professor of biblical studies at Eastern University. He's the author of a new book, The Bible Tells Me So. And he also contributed to the outstanding book from Oxford University Press, The Bible and the Believer. So we've covered two of the obstacles, um, Sola Scriptura and the nature of the Christian Bible. The third one that you bring up is 19th century Protestant identity. So we're talking about the 1800s, mid to late 1800s. There were three historical forces that you say came to a head at this time, evolution, documentary hypothesis, and sort of archaeological historical discoveries. Can you uh, expand on those, give, give people a feel for what issues came up and how that complicated reading the Bible? <clears throat> Sure. I mean, and I'll I'll, I'll be brief as, as I can here, but uh, those three issues combined within a relatively short period of time, about 20, 30 years. Yeah, it's like a perfect to, storm, right? It was a perfect storm, and I think I call it a one, two, three punch to the gut, and, yeah. and or the one, two, three punch to the gut and the knockout punch to the jaw, where um, things that had been sort of eh, uneasy about or questioned about now became much harder to deny, which is basically this. The Bible doesn't give historical accounts the way we think of history. Yeah. The Bible is doing something else, and in fact, the Bible might not even have been written any time near when some of these events were supposed to have happened. And that that's a big blow for um, you know much of the history of Christianity, which is, you know, again, the Church Fathers, you can't lump them into this category, but by and large, um, the, the, the Bible gives you accurate information about what happened, and you don't really need to question that, whether it's Adam right. as the first person, or the exodus happened, or the conquest happened, or things like that. And in the 19th century, that started to change, because you have scientific evidence for where life came from, and that doesn't line up at all with Genesis, so you have to say, my goodness, which one is right? Um, archaeological evidence that unearthed uh, myths from first from Babylonian cultures, and then as time went on, Canaanite culture and an Egyptian culture that told stories of creation and of origins that are the same as the Bible. No, not the same as the Bible, but they're breathing the same air. They, they use concepts and uh, language that are similar to each other, and that puts the Bible, the biblical story of, of origins, into an ancient Near Eastern context, yeah. rather than a modern one. And so people started saying, well, is it just a story just like every other? Um, and the third issue is, is uh, things that came out of biblical scholarship in France and Germany in the 18th century and, and even earlier that are boring and complicated to get into, but they have <laughs> to do with paying attention to the Hebrew, and you can start discerning that there are different layers of authorship in various portions of the Old Testament, whether it's the Pentateuch or Isaiah or some other places, and that suggests that there were different traditions in ancient Israel uh, that were recorded somehow, either orally or written, that existed and that were not brought together until sometime after the Israelites came back from Babylonian exile in, 580, in 539 B.C., so in other words, you have the, the, the Bible that we have as a result of a lengthy, hundreds of years at least, development and compilation that gets its final stamp of, of, um, of structure. It gives its, its final sort of a way of looking, its final story, its final parameters are given, you know, 
in the 400s, maybe 300s, somewhere around there, after the Israelites came back from Babylon, and they had mm-hmm. to record their story because they've been through a lot. And yeah. now they're recording their story from their point of view, engaging older sources and older traditions, and not just making things up, but drawing on those ancient traditions, but yet putting it together in a certain way that, again, tells us that what they're giving us is not eyewitness accounts of what happened. They're giving us their story of their faith, which has historical implications, it has historical intersections, but it's not history the way we think of it. And those three things together, uh, it's, it's, it's a blow from which um, many quarters of Protestantism haven't yet recovered. They're still fighting those battles of the 19th century. That's where Bible colleges developed Hmm. in the early 20th century to fight what was happening and saying, we're going to stand by the Bible. Yeah. Right. That's where fundamentalism came from. That's, you know, all these things are still coming from that. So. And it's interesting that, for example, um, I talked to Mark Brettler about the way the fundamentalism in a way grew out of modernist assumptions. So the idea was, hey, we want to stick to the Bible and not let these modern ideas corrupt the way that we read God's Word. But at the same time, they were adopting the same sort of assumptions about, like you said, what history should be. Uh, right. That if someone wrote something, that that was a literal history, say, of the creation. It happened in six 24-hour days, and and right. this was created before this. And, and so they adopted modern assumptions, but in, but believed they were sort of going back to this original – where they're maintaining some sort of original fidelity to the text. There's a lot of irony there, I think. There's a huge irony, and I agree 100 percent with what Mark said. Um, and it's, it's actually a common criticism of fundamentalism and evangelicalism that you have the same modernist assumptions. For example, any book that claims to have been inspired by God, point number one, has to be historically accurate, because God wouldn't screw it up. Mm-hmm. And that begins with Genesis chapter 1. That has to give us some type of accurate assessment of what happened in time and space. Um, I, you know... That, that's, that sounds like a that, – that's going to be termed a modern assumption of what biblical texts have to look like. Um, even within the Christian tradition, if, you know, we, we go back to, you know, the earlier interpreters of Scripture, the early Church Fathers, mm-hmm. they were very flexible in how they understood some of these things. They actually understood the wisdom of having to allegorize mm-hmm. things. Because the the truth and the depth is far beyond what we would think of as literal, and um, yeah, at the, without saying they're right about everything, that's that that, that trajectory is a very healthy one, I think. Uh, I was uh, just going to mention even the New Testament, when you see how the New Testament authors, especially Paul and the Gospel mm-hmm. writers, how they engage the Old Testament, they're not handling it literally. Right. They're handling it symbolically, metaphorically, and and primarily, they're handling it. Christologically. So, you know, built into our tradition is an understanding that a proper handling of Scripture has to go beyond simply this records things that happen like a textbook or a newspaper. Yeah, so we're basically dealing at this point with with a lot of fallout that occurred from these all these forces coming together and biblical scholarship becoming professionalized and churches multiplying and, and people confronting these different issues. You talk about three different choices that you faced personally when you were sort of introduced to uh, some of these issues. You, you told a really interesting story in, um, in The Bible Tells Me So, I, I believe, where you were, in, you were at school and you're reading from the Old Testament an, an account of a, an actual rock following Israel around, right? That Israel yeah. followed them through. <laughs> yeah. So, and you all yeah. thought that was funny. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but then then your teacher had you all open up to P- Paul, right? That's correct. Yeah, yeah. He was. Um, this is in graduate school, and um, my professor was James Kugel, a very well known uh, mm-hmm. Jewish uh, scholar. He uh, was recounting a- an ancient rabbinic tradition of um, how the Israelites got water in the desert. And one tradition has, uh, I mean, there, there are several traditions that are similar, but the one that he focused on was how the rock that Moses struck, um, actually the, the rock that water came from back in Exodus chapter 17, at the beginning of mm-hmm. their wandering after Mount Sinai, um, 
actually before Mount Sinai, but at the beginning of the wilderness wandering, they had this rock that gave them water. And then a rock appears again in Numbers chapter 20, which is at the end of the 40 years. And these rabbis, you know, they argued, and I'm laughing as I'm saying it, because they probably didn't believe it either, but they, yeah. they said, this rock moved in the <laughs> desert. It actually followed them around. It's sort of like a portable drinking fountain, yeah. which makes sense, because the Bible never really explains where they get water from for 40 years. It talks about manna. Right. We got the food part down. We don't have the water part down. So right. they, they sort of filled in that gap. And I remember, you know, hearing this and thinking to myself, you know, this is so creative. It's it's wrong, but it's so creative. <laughs> and and then he says, and now turn to First Corinthians ten four, and mm-hmm. there, sure enough, you have Paul, who who brings a Christological dimension to the Old Testament, which he always does. That's that's what Christians mm-hmm. do. But he says the rock that followed them, or the rock that accompanied them, was Christ. Mm-hmm. So. It's not just the rock in the desert that provided water was Christ, this sort of symbolic, typological, Christological reading, but he also has as part of his understanding of the Old Testament, this movable nature of the rock. Right. Which means Paul's Jewish, right? Yep, right. <laughs> and he's influenced by these traditions that were probably very old by the time Paul came around. And that made me think, my goodness gracious, um, I have no idea who this Paul is. Yeah. I went, I went to seminary, and I never heard of this before. I never saw it, never noticed it. And I had this Jewish, historically located Paul, and I hope yeah. everyone's hearing that in the most positive sense. Yeah, yeah. Jewish, historically located Paul was opening up in front of me, and you know what? He's not a Protestant. He's not a Presbyterian. He's not an evangelical. Yeah. And i got to come to terms with that somehow, and, and to help me make sense of my Bible— that is behaving in a way I was told it can't behave and shouldn't behave. The question comes up, too, why why take Paul seriously, then? If he's packing in these assumptions about the rock, for example, um, and it seems to me that it's that Paul understood the Hebrew Scriptures you know, quite well, is, is what it seems like, but he also, <coughs> there, there are assumptions in there. Maybe he thought that the creation happened in six 24-hour periods or, you know, things like this. Like, what good is a, a, a supposedly prophetic figure or authoritative figure in Christianity who reads the Hebrew Scriptures in ways that modern biblical scholarship suggests are faulty in some way? Like, why even pay attention only, to that? It's, Paul, in that respect, is only a problem if we place upon Scripture a certain expectation of acting as an authority of a certain kind. Mm-hmm. In other words, an authority that tells us what happened or exactly how to think about everything in the Bible. What I see when I see Paul is a thoroughly encultured first century Jew captured by Jesus talking about him and using his Bible to do it. And the reason I like Paul, <laughs> the reason I, I want to pay it close attention to Paul, is because for him, Christ is primary. Mm-hmm not Scripture. And that sounds like I'm dissing the Bible, or I'm saying Paul's dissing the Bible. Paul would never diss the Bible. He's Jewish. He would never, ever do that. But for him, even his Scripture, even his tradition, is trumped by a crucified and risen Savior. That's an important thing to keep in mind. Like the the (laughs) event, yeah, the the event changes. (laughs) Everything, right? right? That sort of becomes the lens through which you go back. And that's what Christians did, was they read the Old Testament, right? They'd go back and find things that they would tie to the mission of Christ. They'd say, oh, this right. was... And sometimes I think they do it well, sometimes I think they don't do it well, but yeah. what do I know? That's just my opinion, but it's okay to have those opinions. So the it's question okay then is, like, why... If So Paul met... Paul says that he met Christ, right? That he right. he had an experience... With, why doesn't Christ say, oh, hey, by the way, Paul, um, you know, the creation account in Genesis is, like, not scientifically accurate like what you know like right. that would solve well, if you they know had what, put it's, it's, one verse in there that would solve a lot of problems like but down think the road, about right? it but think you're asking the question everybody asked to think about it and this is something that I, did, I i didn't think about this until fairly recently when the friend of mine whose wife is a physician mm-hmm. said to me okay here are things jesus could have done to make, make our lives a lot easier hey uh before you treat that guy who's been stabbed by that spear wash your hands yeah. thoroughly yeah. Or, hey, you boil know, before you drink, boil the water. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. can save yourself a lot of But none of that, yeah. right? See, th- that's, and I think this gets down to who is Jesus, yeah. right? And we sort of think he's like 
you know, this humanity thing is just a shell, but that's not really him. Mm-hmm. You know, Jesus is divine and up there, and he sort of makes a cameo appearance. The thoroughgoing humanness of Jesus, which is fundamental to a Christian, a Protestant Christian, you know, Catholic Christian, whatever, confession of faith, that has implications. The incarnation has implications, and Jesus is being a first century Jew as well, and Paul met him, right, yeah. as the risen Christ, but even there, Paul, okay, Paul is, is, is inspired by the Spirit of Christ to do what he does, but he's inspired as a first century Jew, mm-hmm. and Jesus doesn't have to take him out of that and make him a modern Protestant to make this work. Yeah. Because it doesn't matter, because at the end of the day, it's not about, okay, Paul, let's have a Bible study to make sure you get Scripture right at every single point so that 2,000 years from now people aren't confused. Right. It's, all that is a vehicle to the bigger thing, which is the event of Christ. And I suppose it probably and, even would have made less sense in his own context. I mean, that those things weren't being discussed anyway, so it would be very strange for him to, to you know, he he would be... Instead of testifying of Christ, he would be analyzing the Bible, I guess, right? Well, I think that's a fair way to put it, and confusing people, too, right? So right, they'd be we, like, I don't when get we this, read, yeah. yeah, and and what's the point of that, right? Yeah. So, you know, when, when, when he is preaching the gospel, whether it's writing in letters or going places, he is doing it as a first-century Jew with those assumptions and with those ways of looking at the world. And it's not like Paul says, well, I know better now, but I guess I'll sort of condescend and be Jewish. He's just doing what he does. He, yeah. he doesn't know anything else. Yeah. And, and I respect—see, the thing is, that's, that's not chronological snobbery. That's not looking back and saying, oh, pff, oh, puny primitive people, we know better. Right. It's not that we know better. It's, it's just we, we're human beings at a different point in history, and yeah. we see things differently, but we're still claiming the same faith in Christ that sometimes doesn't make sense for us in the same way that it couldn't have made sense for Jews back then. Yeah. And I think it's, that— It's counterintuitive. And that can inject some epistemic humility for scholars as well, right? It's the recognition that we're also constrained by— uh, for all the wonderful tools that have been developed by scholars over the years that are still very useful, there's still a sense that we're constrained by our own, you know, our horizons in the present. Sure. That something could come along later that overturns assumptions that we carry today. So I think that's another yeah. uh, way of looking at it. But we're only human. Uh, you talked about three different options that you faced um, when you first became really aware of some of these issues in in the Bible. You had the option of avoiding them, uh, avoiding just sort of, oh, I'm not really interested in that and moving along, which I think a lot of people, it's an appealing thing to do. If the, if their religion's working for them, why get into all these arcane arguments? So defend, uh, avoiding is sort of a thing people do. There's defending, and that's sort of digging your heels in and – and resisting advancements of scholarship or even selectively using it to just point out, as you mentioned earlier, to just verify what you already think. And then there's uh, the option of synthesizing, and that's making use of scholarship responsibly to engage in these really deep issues. And that, that's that's kind of risky, and we'll, I want to expand on that. But before we do, there is one option that you didn't mention, and that was just, mm-hmm. just quit altogether. And I think this yeah. is one that a lot of people – that's Too true. many people probably take this. I mean, I'm sure you're familiar with people who have, and I'm just curious about your sort of reaction to that phenomenon of people that face these things and just say, you know, bag the whole thing. Right, right. And and for, see, for me, that wasn't on my radar screen. Yeah. So that wasn't an active option for me, but it's absolutely an active option for people, and I don't blame them. Yeah. If If the paradigm that they have is – for them conceptually, the only possible paradigm you can have for God, right? Yeah. So, and if that just makes no sense, I mean, if that if their only other option is to say, "Listen, I don't think there is a God," or "I don't, I'm not sure, and I don't care," you know, um, there's actually there's a degree of integrity in that kind of decision. And I know some atheists are boorish, and yeah. you know, they get on your nerves. But I I, I know atheists who aren't like that. You know, yeah. they're just, they're trying to figure things out, and and I respect them for it. But that wasn't an option for me, just where my headspace was. What, differ- like, what was God the was difference for you? Like, you just had an already grounded, like, for you, what made the difference? 
I don't know. I think I sensed already, and partly it's because of in seminary saying, put things on a shelf. Mm -hmm. The world's bigger than you think it is. And that was a very valuable lesson for me, that I don't think every one who goes to, let's say, a conservative Protestant, Protestant seminary necessarily gets that um, that kind of culture, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, placed on them. So I was very thankful for that. But, you know, maybe I just I just had a, a growing intuition, a growing sense that, you know, the existence of a higher power can't depend on the degree to which I can understand and make sense of things. Yeah. That that God is actually not irrational, but transrational mm. and trans data and all that. I and I really I think I was beginning to sense as I as I feel more strongly now the the reality of things that I can't control in the yeah. universe, like, like mystery and, and that. And I know that's sort of a sexy word for some people, but I mean yeah. it. it. It's frustrating that there's mystery. But if God is real, I can't get him entirely. Yeah. And I just have to work with that. And I think I've just, I came to terms with that in sort of an incohate way fairly early on. So that, I think that's why yeah. I had the other options. And that gave you some measure of flexibility, whereas a more rigid perspective, if people are brought up with this very rigid, this is the way it has to be, it's all or nothing, these are the things. And then when you encounter conflicting data, you really, you're just more brittle at that point, I think. And I, I've seen, like you, I've seen that happen. And, um, you know, right. fortunately for me, it really hasn't come out that way. Uh, there, but for the grace of God, go uh, you and I, I guess. But right, exactly right. Um, so the so let's get to synthesis then, and I want to talk one specific example that you draw out in the Bible tells me so. But right. you're talking about synthesis, and the example I want you to mention is with the instances of genocide in the Old Testament. I had a a friend, fellow member of the church, come to me. He knows I kind of like books and stuff, and he said, yeah, we're studying the Old Testament this year in Sunday school, and I'm reading this story where God says, all right, uh, Israelites, uh, here are these people, and uh, here is their land. Isn't this great land? But the catch is you have to go in there and just slaughter everybody, men, women, children, sheep, goats, you know, the whole thing. Kill them all. And he says, I just, that's a God that's very unsettling to me, but it's in the Bible though. Right. So right. you suggest that understanding biblical scholarship can help alleviate the discomfort that we get from that type of story, right? I think so. I think in fact, it doesn't give us much choice, but, but to do that. Um, and the reason I, th that's the first issue I, I, I uh, talk about in the Bible tells me so, because that's one of two or three issues that always comes up in church contexts. Mm. Um, you know, just very briefly, I, I've been, um, I'm not Episcopalian, but I play one on TV. I've been going to <laughs> a Episcopal church for about four years now. Okay. And, um, uh, there is a, a church, not a parish not far from ours, where, you know, Episcopalians don't read the Bible. I, that's the, you know we're joking here. They do, but they don't. You know, yeah. so th this church was going through. Let's read the Bible in a year, and mm -hmm. within a month, I'm getting a phone call saying, uh, "Can you come explain this stuff to us? Yeah. Because <laughs> God's killing everybody." Okay, yeah, that's fine. Let's talk about it. So it's a common phenomenon yeah. to to read the Bible, and by the time you get to chapter six, God drowns everybody. <laughs> right. And you know you keep moving, and there's just a lot of violence, and and the. Um, the, the Canaanite extermination yeah. is probably the parade example that people look at. So, um, and uh, you know, the synthesis is basically this: uh, archaeological investigations in that part of the world that have been going on for a hundred years now. Um, here's basically what they've found: there are maybe two or three sites that corroborate generally some type of violent takeover. But the book of Joshua mentions 31 towns. Hmm. And of those 31 towns, uh, remember, like, roughly 16 of them are said to be taken through some violent conquest. Yeah. Well, of those 16, there are maybe two or three that fit. Um, some towns that are said to have been taken or occupied didn't exist at the time. They existed later. And even in some cases, um, towns that the Bible doesn't mention as having some type of battle evidence in, in, in archaeological data, um, 
the Bible says nothing happened there, something did happen there. Yeah. In, in according to archaeological evidence, so it's it's somewhat of a mess, but it's it's hard to find um, a trained biblical scholar who would say anything other than the conquest of Canaan that we have in the book of Joshua is probably a significant exaggeration written at a later time to buttress Israelite ideology about who it is as a world player. Um, its status among other peoples, and the status of its God. Hmm. Um, so, okay, well, now you have the Bible lying about history. Well, hold on here. That's again, Yeah, that's what I was going to say, Pete. Of, is now yeah. Pete, yeah, some people are going to say, oh, that's all well and good. Now you've got rid of that untidy little story. Uh-huh. But why believe any of it at that point? All right. Well, I, again, the thing is, what do we mean by believing it, right? Because here we have now probably a story which— like virtually anything you can point to in the Old Testament on some level, you can see the historical echoes of something that would have given rise to these stories, but the stories themselves reflect a a later rumination on the part of a people defining its own existence. It's really a statement of faith in terms of who are we and who is God and how do we relate to people outside of us. Yeah. So in Joshua, you know, the outsiders are the Canaanites and they're bad, but, you know, you go elsewhere in the Old Testament and things aren't quite as clear, because you have the prophet Jonah, who is supposed to preach repentance to the Ninevites, who are the Assyrians, who are really bad people, right? So, I mean, you have within Scripture, let's say, this kind of diversity of thinking through the issue of, listen, we believe that we're the people of God, and this God is the true God, but you know what? Maybe he's not just our property. Maybe maybe this God has a bigger picture in mind. Maybe he's the God of these enemies over here. And of course, that's developed even more in the New Testament. So anyway, but the sense that, that, that kind of thinking that I'm laying out here, which is, you know, just where my head is at this point, um, that's driven by an attempt to synthesize this Bible that we have with outside information that affects how I understand it. And your argument seems to be then uh, that you have a faith in God and you see these stories as being particular people's attempts to reckon with God and to sort of also reckon with their own identities. And so the Bible isn't necessarily telling us this straight up history of all these stories, but rather reflecting people's specific people's engagement with God and everything that comes with that, which is their own assumptions and... Their own culture. Culture, yeah. Which you can't get away... There is no expression of God that ex, that goes beyond culture. You always have a cultural dimension because we're human beings, and yeah. and what we're seeing there is their cultural expression. And, and one of the analogies I use in the book, which um, some people find very helpful, others find... And, incredibly trivializing, but I'll try it here, um, (laughs) is uh, the Bible is what it looks like when God lets his children tell the story. They tell the story of God from their point of view, with God there with them and next to them, but they're explaining God as best as they can within the culture that provides their language and their concepts. See, this is why Israel's God, Yahweh, is a warrior who kills enemies with the sword and leads them into battle. Does God really do that? I, I, my opinion, no. I don't think that he really does that, but right. I know why they say it, and I have to try to understand that and respect what they say and come to terms with it, not talk down to it, but say, listen, I know why they're saying this. And and then the step for Christians is, okay, now how does this contribute to our understanding of the gospel, our understanding of the Christian life, and without it becoming a rule book or sort of a reference manual, for we have to, you know, this has to be true and God has to be like this, right? Yeah. So in that way, the Bible becomes a spur for people to reflect on their own relationship to God and their own cultural context in a way like the Israelites, like we're all Israelites in a sense then, right? Like we're supposed to have an engagement with God and as Christians through Christ— uh, and do the same sort of attempt to live that they did, right? And it's going to have similar constraints, but just for our own times, and sort of puts us, I think, in the position of being being biblical, right? Not just mm-hmm. looking to the Bible, but being biblical ourselves in a way, if that makes sense. Right. I might add one thing to that, sure. um, and that is 
we're always looking to the Bible, not only through our own, let's say, cultural moment, which is unavoidable, but there is something also distinctly Christian about it, which yeah. is we do read the Bible through the lens of the Gospel. And I think that's the fundamental definition of how Christians read their Bible, and I see it modeled all over the place in the New Testament, that Jesus makes the difference in how we engage Scripture. We're still engaging Scripture, but we're engaging Scripture Christianly. Right. And so, in a sense, the authority is not an authority we can put down. Here are the ten things you must always do, but the authority is the reality of the risen Christ and the Spirit of Christ dwelling in and among the Church. Yeah. Which doesn't mean we all come to the same answers, does it? <laughs> no, obviously <laughs> <There> are, not. <laughs> obviously not. And and I think that's another thing to grapple with. Maybe maybe God's fine with that. Maybe one denomination doesn't have it all right, and our quest is to find a denomination that does. Right. Because it's usually mine, right? It's usually it's, mine. It's usually mine. Well, it's, usually <laughs> it's the one that's in power, right? <laughs> so that's, that's the one that usually wins that debate. So. It's Dr. Peter Enns. He's a professor of biblical studies at Eastern University. We're talking about his books... The Bible tells me so in the Bible and the believer. We'll take a break and we'll be right back with the conclusion of this interview. Sam Brown was a teenaged atheist struggling to get a firmer footing. On an August Sunday morning in 1990, he found himself sitting at the sacrament table in an LDS chapel next to his brother and two close friends, preparing to utter a prayer over the water. What brought him back? How did he go on to write a careful, sympathetic, scholarly book on Joseph Smith and early Mormon theology? And how did his research shape his faith? Find out in the Maxwell Institute's new book, First Principles and Ordinances, The Fourth Article of Faith in Light of the Temple. Following on the heels of Adam Miller's Letters to a Young Mormon, Sam Brown's book is the latest in the Institute's Living Faith series. These are books aimed at spiritual and intellectual inspiration. You can find First Principles and Ordinances by Samuel M. Brown at maxwellinstitute.byu.edu or on amazon.com. All right, we're back with Dr. Peter Enns, professor of biblical studies at Eastern University. His new book, The Bible Tells Me So, was just released from Harper. Um, we're going to wind things down here by talking a little, a little bit about scholarship and devotion. There, there are many easy ways to dismiss what you're proposing, Pete. I think traditionalist-minded folks might accuse you of watering down the Bible to appease modern sensibilities or like being politically correct or something. Skeptics might say that, well, we don't need to listen to Pete because he's a believer. And so whatever scholarship he does, we know he's stacking the deck and that he's already got his mind made up. So there are all these sorts of ways to dismiss you. Have you gotten any pushback as you've been publishing these books on the Bible? Is, does this, do these voices sound accurate to you in terms of what, how people sort of responded that haven't liked your work? Um, yeah, certainly. Uh, you know, it's hard to write a book about God. Which yeah. isn't going to get pushed back from somebody, and that's, you know, that's fine. I mean, on one level, I try to listen to criticism because sometimes they say things that are worthwhile. But yeah. you know, some criticism is from people who are not of goodwill, and you know, just keep going. But yeah, it happens certainly. Yeah. Like, do you conceive of yourself as being a Christian scholar versus a scholar of Christianity? Hmm. Well, I've never really thought about that. I, I guess I would say that I'm. I'm a Christian who's a scholar, and I'm trying to think through how those two things can be in conversation, how they can talk to each other, and the implications of that for myself and for other people as we walk through this life. So, and I kind of see that. Existence. Yeah, yeah. I, well, I kind of see that with the Bible tells me so. This is obviously written for a more popular audience. You, you're using. You, you know, you're humorous throughout the book. It's it's on a level that a lot of readers could understand. It it avoids really arcane and jargon and this sort of thing. Does writing more popular works like this ever get in the way of your more academic work, or is is it pretty? Have you negotiated the relationship there pretty well in terms of your work? Uh, well, I've a couple of things. I've I've tried to create a switch inside my brain where I can switch on and off and, and sort of go from one to the other and just be very conscious about what I'm doing. But, you know, it's it's not a stress for me to write in a popular vein. And, you know, I just sort of talk. And, and people who know me uh, have said, you know, 
I know you wrote this book because I recognize your voice in it. And yeah. to me, that that means a lot because that's this is how I talk, for better or for worse. Yeah, um, you know, that, that's that's how I, I I I try to communicate concepts. So, you know, it's it's um. It doesn't get in the way of academic work. Uh, it's just a decision that I made actually many years ago that I wanted to uh, write things and engage people um, in a broader audience than simply an academic audience where you write something and, you know, 500 people will have read it 10 years later. You know, I, mm. I just I don't want to do that. That's not how I want to spend my days. Other people do, which is great. I yeah. don't want to spend my days doing that. What book are you most proud of? Is there a book that you've put out? Um, I know you're here, obviously you're here to promote Bible tells me, so I think it's a great book. Um, so let's just say that's your favorite one. But in addition to that, like what, like what, do you have a book that was just something that you always knew, like, I've got to write this one book, uh, or is that something you're still reaching to do? Um, I think each time I write a book, I have that same feeling. Mm. Um, so, you know, now it's the Bible tells me so, uh, but a couple of years ago, you know, I wrote a book, The Evolution of Adam, which is a synthesis of science and biblical scholarship. Mm-hmm. And again, fairly popular book, uh, not not quite as popular as this one. And, you know, before that, one of the big ones was the book Inspiration and Incarnation, which is, you know, looking at how we look at Jesus as the incarnate Son of God, divine and human, and how if we look at the Bible as analogous to that, we can understand why it has all these human qualities like you know, mythic elements or contradictions or things mm-hmm. like that. So, and in each one of those um, is one that, you know, I've kept my ear to the ground and, and, and I think people have liked those books. Some people haven't, but again, that's, if, if, if you know, if you're not prepared for that, don't write. Yeah, right. Don't, don't talk, don't think, don't do anything, but it's going to happen. So. Right, right. Uh, yeah. So I, I, those are the three probably that I, I think the most about is having an influence and, and getting at, let's say, the larger program that I have in my mind about what I want to do. Right. So you have uh, you work in the academy. You have things that you do. You're a professor. You do books for more for scholarly audience. You do books for more popular audience. You also mentioned that you, you attend church meetings, uh, Episcopalian meetings. Do you ever find your teeth grinding, uh, you know, if someone's giving a— sermon or, or re- doing a scripture reading where you're like, oh, like, do you ever feel like, oh, if they knew this, nope. this would change that? <laughs> nope. I mean, yeah, maybe once in the past four years, but no, I, I don't feel that way. And one reason why my wife and I have decided to sort of make this move over to the Episcopal world is because my whole life I was doing that very thing, yeah. listening to sermons or Sunday school classes, and I'm thinking, who am I? <laughs> You know, I mean, I actually think I have something to offer here, but if if coming to church is just another intellectual exercise, then everything is filtered through my head. Yeah. And I I was getting really sick and tired of my head. Yeah. And I I needed to do something different. So, you know, I go and you know to to uh, you know what is usually a 10 to 12 minute homily, which is a part of the service but not the whole thing. Mm-hmm. And I have to let go of my brain, and that's that's a good exercise for me. So, so you found a way to just to engage devotionally and and not have to worry. I mean, like you said, it's not really your job, right? I mean, you're not right. you're not there to correct or you know arbitrate. I, I guess so. No, and I think that's one of the um, unintended consequences. And th- I'm going to make a blanket statement. Be ready. This is one. <laughs> unintended consequences of the Protestant evangelical program because it's rooted around things like, I have a better argument than you do. Yeah. Therefore, my way of doing it is better. So in seminary, we were trained to listen to sermons with a very critical eye. Yeah. Where, where is the theology wrong? What is he doing wrong? Not mm-hmm. what is right. And that, that has an effect on you. And, and, you know, for a lot of reasons in my own life, that that whole thing began to crumble. Hmm. You know, I'm, funny you should mention this. The book that I'm working on now, which won't come out for a couple of years, it's all about this. Hmm. It's all about moving from a paradigm of being no, being certain about what you think and knowing what you think and having better arguments. What happens and when life happens to you and that sort of crumbles and yeah. you have to move to a different way of thinking about what your faith is like. And and I learned that. I'm happy that it was it was a it was a wonderful lesson. It's been a great journey. I'm glad that I took it. 
Well, that's good. Yeah, I look forward to that. I mean, that's something that I think that uh, Mormon scholars that I've spoken with. So does my with, publisher, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a I bit can... late, but Mickey's not listening to this, so that's fine. Oh, okay. Good, good. <laughs> good. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say, I think a lot of Mormon scholars feel that way as well. They try to find a way. In, in the LDS Church, you also attend Sunday school class, and that's more an open discussion. And there's a lay person in the congregation who's chosen to teach, and they, they teach out of church manuals, and then members of the class sort of sound off. And so I know sometimes it's difficult um, to sit in class and hear things where, you know, things that you've learned right. in your training sort of contradict. And, and I think that, you know, a lot of people do try to find that healthy balance of being able to recognize what's really happening in a Sunday school class is devotional right. and, and, and not having to, to you know, engage your brain the whole time and that sort of thing. But so, yeah, the last question that I had involved the book that you did with um, doctors Harrington and Brettler and um, the Bible and the believer, where you bring a Catholic, a Jew and a Protestant together to talk about the ways they interpret the Bible. There was this really interesting part uh, where you're responding to Dr. Brettler. Uh, Dr. Brettler sort of talking about the, the Bible being, you know, you can take all these different perspectives from it and there's really no, central guiding, I don't know if authority is the right word to it or not, but was there anything in the process of dialoguing with Dr. Brettler that you found uh, unsettling about either of the other views? And conversely, uh, what benefits did you get out of hearing from these other views? Well, I think, you know, much more the latter than the former. Um, You know, it wasn't the first time any of us had engaged other traditions and how we think about things. So, and it came out of a conference that we did at the um, University of Pennsylvania, and which and a lot of people were there because they're interested in this this sort of trialogue. So, you know, the, the, we had all been sort of around the block a few times with it. But I think one thing that uh, struck me as just sort of window opening, you know, and another one of these moments where I said, you know, this is this is so much sense to this. I just need to keep thinking along these lines. Is exactly what you just said. You know, there there is no controlling um, authority that – not that I'm against authority. I, I don't want that to come out wrong, but there, there is no controlling paradigm or authority that restricts how you – understand the Bible or conclusions you come to. Yeah. Now, the thing is, there are there are always parameters. There is always a place where you don't go. I, I, I definitely get that. But it's, it's not a central concern, which sometimes comes up, well, very often comes up in conservative Protestantism. You, you have, here is the line. Before you start, here is the line. If you cross it, you're wrong. Right. Okay, proceed. You know, and, <laughs> right. and you don't have that kind of um, stricture as quickly, let's put it this way, in Judaism as you might in at least conservative Protestantism. Yeah. And that's just a reminder to me that there are other ways of doing this Bible thing. Right. So you found, I mean, overall, the exercise was useful and... Yeah, very much so. It was, it was wonderful. I mean, you know, we, after the conference, we sat at a restaurant and had dinner, the three of us, plus um, the, the, the conference organizers and a couple of other people... And um, I think it was Mark who said, we should make this into a book. And, you know, Daniel, who, who is deceased, he died about a year ago. Yeah. Uh, he, and there's my phone ringing, but we'll ignore that. Um, he said, oh, yeah, absolutely. Let's let's do that. And then, of course, he's got tremendous uh, experience in publishing and editing and things like that. So, yeah. you know, at that point, we pretty much right away just said, hey, let's let's do this. And we started working on it. And. And I think it was Mark who secured Oxford University Press and, and got them involved pretty early on. And they said, yeah, this is a great idea. Let's do it. Well, it's a good – also, I think the audio from that is still available online, at least from the conference, I think. I uh, I am certain that it is. I, I actually have it on my um, on my iTunes or something like that, one of those places. Oh, nice. And <laughs> you also have a blog too, right? You blog at Patheos? I, Pathios, right? Yeah, and uh, my my blog is uh, has my name on it. It's called uh, Rethinking Biblical Christianity, which is you know all those these things are important. You're rethinking it is biblical, and it's Christianity, and 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 what does that look like? And, right. and uh, yeah, I have a lot of fun blogging on that. Other than the book that you mentioned that's in pro- in process, do you have any other projects that you're working on that uh, that we should expect? Uh now, the only other thing sort of in the works right now, and that'll come out next summer, is the 10th anniversary edition 
of one of the books I mentioned earlier, Inspiration and Incarnation, mm. where um, that book caused not a little controversy in some quarters of the evangelical world. And um, it's being sort of re-released as a 10th anniversary edition with a lengthy um, postscript by me sort of engaging some of the criticism and what I think the book has done and, and where I think we can go from here. So, um, you know, that's that's I'm looking forward to that coming out because it engages a lot of things that have been discussed over the last 10 years. That's Dr. Peter Enns. He's professor of biblical studies at Eastern University. He's author of the brand new book, The Bible Tells Me So, Why Defending Scripture Has Made Us Unable to Read It. Thanks for joining us today on the Maxwell Institute podcast, Pete. Thanks for having me. I've had a great time. 